Greetings, everybody. We have a special treat for you this week. Whereas we're typically going to see heavily scripted presentations or cartoon foolishness on this channel, today I'm sitting down for a live interview with Tina Hamilton. Thank you for joining us, Tina. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so Tina's here to talk about a research proposal she's written, which is about the effects of coming out as an atheist. Is that correct? Yes, it's basically after one's come out as an atheist. Okay, so the after effects once they already have. Okay, and what got you interested in pursuing this as a topic? Initially, I wanted to do my topic on counselors and what they're providing for atheists. And in looking for that, I found that there really wasn't anything. And so um, I had to narrow my focus down a little bit more to necessarily the coming out process, but rather what happens to have come out, which um, seems to be a lot harder for somebody than the actual coming out decision. Then you're interacting with your families and, and community and so forth and the focus. Okay. And what got you into atheism in general as a topic, as something you'd want to pursue or study? Um, well, I myself am an atheist, and I come from a long I guess you might say, in in uh, various religions, starting out with Catholicism and then various Christianity and then on to Judaism and, and then the list kind of went on and um, finally ending up with Buddhism, Taoism, and then I was already an atheist when I was in in that and then I realized I was, I was an atheist. And I didn't have a, a really um, remarkable coming out process, but I become more involved as an atheist in activism. I then started seeing that people do have my living and people are pretty laid back about religions here. There, there is um, religion, in, I mean, you know, it's definitely there, but when you say you're an atheist, you're not getting the same kind of a response as you would with somebody who's in the Bible Belt. When we had cut off, you were saying that you were interested in this topic, but you were saying it's not as bad mm -hmm. where you live as in other places, right? Right. Basically, I was saying that my coming out was not a big deal, and being an atheist hasn't had a major impact to me until I become more involved in it, and then I become more passionate with it, and then I see how other people are affected, and so that's what's made me even more involved. Okay, and what kind of involvement do you have in the community? Like what kinds of connections or affiliations or whatever? Okay, I'm on the board of Atheist Alliance of America. I'm also on the board of Secular Buddhism. It, it's actually a secular, uh, it's association of mindfulness, meditations, and secular Buddhism. It's also a branch under the Atheist Alliance of America. Okay. Uh, that's probably my biggest connection. I'm also a cardholder member of Americans United Against Church and State or Separation of Church and State. And kind of doing some activism just in school, kind of educating other students and professors about what it's like being an atheist and trying to go with this as far as we're counselors so that counselors give more attention to the atheist needs. Sure. So you really are pretty heavily involved then. But starting to get into your yeah. research, the beginning of your proposal, as, as I read it, mainly described the lack of research addressing the needs of atheists as far as counseling. Why do you think there's been so right. little interest so far? Well, I think originally the psychotherapy field has been more atheist or secular um, way back with the beginning psychotherapists such as like Freud. I think Jung was probably the first that yet. Yeah, he was pretty religious and kind of out there, things into the psychology therapy. But throughout history in the field, up until 1995, it was pretty much 
think they really felt like they needed to focus on atheists. And then in 1995, the APA, the American Psychology Association, they brought in religious and spirituality. And then in uh, 2005, the American Counseling Association, they also brought in religion and spirituality. And so now there's all of this research on religion and spirituality. But I think in, in the excitement of that, there's a gap with atheists. And the only thing that I'm seeing throughout my research and lit reviews is anytime there was any research from the religious spiritualities view and comparing their religious versus atheists and trying to say that the religious had more well-being and so forth. So there's a few people that have tried to address this. There's only been lit review by Dr. Melanie Brewster and her team, and that was in 2014. And They said that there was all this research on the religious and spirituality, but nothing for atheists. And their research project was called Errantly Absent for Atheism. Since then, there's only been a handful of research that has looked into atheists. It's a big gap. And again, it's like the religious thing is is taking over, which is kind of frustrating. Would you say that atheists just kind of slip through the cracks because there's not a lot of public awareness of them? Is that what I'm hearing you saying? So, and I think just the history of where psychology has been and then where they're at now, it's been more recent. And a lot of the counselors that are out there are secular. So I guess they just don't think about it through the cracks. And I think it needs to be addressed, particularly now that we do have so much going on with religion getting attention. For example, myself, I'm trying to find a counselor because as a graduate program, we are required to have counseling, and I can't find an atheist. I can find Christians. I can find people who don't say what they are, so I need to call and ask them. But it's really hard for the atheist community to find an atheist counselor. And sometimes that's what we need rather than somebody who's just secular that might, you know, they're not saying whether they're atheist or not, because I feel like that we have our own needs, particularly in grief and addictions. And I'm kind of getting ahead, but these are areas that are generally hard to look within communities. And again, the atheists are slipping through the cracks. You know, they, they would require a different kind of counseling, I think, in support groups and so forth. That kind of gets to a question I had, which was you stated in your proposal that you wanted to exclusively use the term atheist instead of non-religious or agnostic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that some people are touchy about the differences between all those words. But is that why you want to use that word is to really explicitly address the people who identify as atheists and take that label on and deal with the repercussions of it? Yes. And to normalize atheism. If we're calling it humanist and we're calling it secular or non-religious or agnostic or whatever, it becomes so spread out. All these separate little identities out there, it's really not being addressed as who they are as a whole which they're all atheists. It's important that atheists themselves address themselves as atheists so we can normalize atheism in our country. I'm very much a fan of that as well. I think there's a tendency to shy away from the term because it does have a caustic feel to it in a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm, It does. In fact, our local association up here ended up calling themselves the secular society or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was very much in favor of using the word atheist for that very reason. But I can see why you would want to do that, especially from a counseling perspective if you want to specifically help people who deal with that. Going on to actually what you're proposing doing for the study, because I think that's the big heart of this. It says that you are going to be exploring the possibility that atheists experience something that you call minority stress after coming out. Would you want to describe what that is and maybe expound on what you're hoping to learn about it? Okay. So the term has come from other groups that are marginalized, such as immigration people, LGBTQI people. And the problem is once somebody comes out, then there can be a feeling of isolation. There can be rejection from families or community. This whole sense of marginalization, it adds to a person's stress. It can make a person feel depressed, again, being isolated. So this is something that I think that, again, the counseling 
address and be aware of. So when an atheist client comes in and, and talking about some of the things that they're feeling stressed and stuff so that the counselor can address it, looking down at some other things, you know, like what's your childhood like or something like that. But instead of focusing on has just come out as an atheist, start asking direct questions. So what is happening within your family? What is happening with your community? And how are these things impacting you? So there's basically a lot of connections or a lot of factors that counselors now aren't prepared to take into account when they're dealing with ACS. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. Yes. And you mentioned that the term coming out is borrowed by atheists from the LGBTQI community. Yes. What kinds of parallels do you see or how do you think that borrowing this term affects people's perception of atheists and their experience? What comes from borrowing this term, I guess? Well, I think because when people, somebody coming out, they probably generally think of LGBTQI. And with that comes the idea that they've held something very important to them, of their, their own being, and they've held that secretive. And then when they come out, they get ramifications from their family. Sometimes it's positive, but a lot of times it's rejection and the whole process. So it does parallel with atheists because they feel like they need to be secretive. They might still be going to church or whatever and pretending to be Christian or whatever religion they are when in fact they don't believe it. And so they're kind of pretending and being, they come out, it's a um, similar process as the LGBTQI. Yeah, and I could certainly see the parallels as far as the repercussions in the community or what people think about mm -hmm. you. One thing I'd never really put together as a connection that you mentioned is how important that part of your identity is and how important it is for, to be free to express it. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting connection because that's really important to me. It's strange that not believing in God is something that is a part of you that's hard to keep to yourself. Yeah. Um, but I could see the whole issue of being able to be curious and think freely and not pretend to be something that you're not would be pretty important. So right. that's an interesting part of that I hadn't considered. Right. It's so, kind of an odd thing. Sorry, this is a little bit going off on a tangent, but I was just out on a run today and I was out thinking and, and I've thought this several times. It's just so odd. Being an atheist, somebody who does not believe in God, where 80 something percent of uh, Americans believe in some God, some deity that, you know, is kind of pulling the strings of things or that they pray to or whatever. And it follows my mind that you actually are shunned if you don't believe in the fairy tale where, <laughs> you know, where else do we have this in life? You know, where if you don't believe in unicorns or, or leprechauns, nobody's going to shun you. But if you don't believe in God, then it's a it's being the bad person or something. It's just really sad and hard for me to sometimes comprehend as an atheist now. That is one of the most bizarre things about our society to me is that that's one of the worst things you can say about yourself to a lot of people. That'll instantly degrade you in their eyes, even if you don't consider religion a fairy tale, or you don't think it's something kind of way out there, just your factual lack of belief in something impacts how people see your character. And that's really bizarre to me. Right. Yeah. And I could see that being one of the really hard things people struggle with when they're trying to come out too, is that level of perception. So I can see how that would be really drastic and something that maybe the counseling community just doesn't have their even beginning to get a grasp on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. As far as how you're going to go about this study, how are you going to start to get a feel for what people's experiences are or what they're dealing with? Well, in my proposal, I used a qualitative study called Phenomenological, and it is a very experience, um, the, the lived experience of a person. In a small sample, rather than where we look at quantitative and in that, you use large sampling. This is taking a small sample. It's kind of like an anthropologist would do when they do a field study. Not quite. There's another kind of a theory where you actually do. It's called ethno. But this isn't that. But it's close to that in that you don't have direct questions or interview. It's more just kind 
personal, but with prompts, a feel for what the of the atheist in the problems and challenges that they went through after coming out as an atheist. And if this study could be done, then the next step later down the road is to get the lived experience of what the atheist goes through. If I'm hearing you right, it's not about collecting hard data as much as getting the picture out there to counselors of what they're dealing with and how they can better help them cope with it. Exactly. And it sounds like as far as finding people to participate in this, you're looking mostly for people in online atheist groups. Right. And one of the things that we didn't mention at the beginning in my introduction is I am a graduate student. I'm still a student. And I do not have a PhD where most people who lead research, they are PhD, not most, but they are. So I could be on a team. But what I am going to do is send my proposal to the one group of people who has done some research and see if they would be interested in either implementing or something like this. And if I could be part of the team, once I graduate, I can be on the team. Even as a graduate student, I can be on a research team, but I can't lead the research. So I just needed to clarify on that. So right now was from a project for my major assignment in school. And it's something that I want to continue with. To me, it's not just a school assignment. To me, it's something that I want to carry on as a professional. Yeah, so at this point, it's dependent on people with PhDs to pick it up and decide to run with it. So in answer to your question, because you wanted to know where I would be getting, um, it would just be through the Atheist Alliance Association and uh, various online groups just putting out saying that this research people who would be interested in being participants and in this type of research they actually call co-researchers so they're actually part of the research rather than being a subject they are the participant they are a co-researcher so it would just be put out there in some of the various online atheist communities and go from there. Once you found them, what would be involved most likely on the part of the participants or co-researchers? Well, a few things. First of all, would be one that they're 18 years or older. Second, that they are an atheist that came out from a religion, that have recovered from religion or in the process of recovering from a religion rather than somebody who's been an atheist all their life. So we're really looking at somebody who has went through the process of coming out and then the experience of after they've come out. So those are two of the criteria that I would be looking at. Okay. Now you're still hoping for somebody to pick this up and go with it. Do you have any sense of how this has been received or what kind of interest there might be? Or are you just kind of still waiting to see what happens? Well, I haven't been able to contact Brewster yet. I did find her information, so I do have contact information now. So I just need to send the proposal to her. As far as being received by other people who have read it, other atheists, including yourself, interested in it and feel like it's really something that is with, including people in the counseling field, my professors and so forth, they thought it was pursuing. I'm sorry, what's that last part? I didn't catch you. The professors within my counseling program also feel like it's something worth pursuing. Oh, good. And do you think it helps that you're kind of filling a void in current research, that this is something that hasn't been addressed yet? It seems like there's yes. a lot of opportunity there to me. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And what kinds of obstacles you might see going forward if this started to gain any traction? Do you think there'd be any kickback considering the role of religion in our society or I don't know. I think it's probably not so much a kickback, but rather more people thinking, oh, there's not a need for it. Because they're like, oh, well, and, and I have seen this within the counseling field. Well, there's a lot of secular counselors. Within the counseling field, you are supposed to bracket your own values. So if you are a Christian or of another religion, you're not supposed to push that onto your clients. So in a way, they 
there's kind of a, oh, it's really not necessary because already counselors aren't, you know, preaching or proselytizing to their clients. But on the other hand, they're also not fully meeting the needs of an atheist client. So if anything, I think it's just more, oh, there's really not a need for it. But in fact, there is. That's interesting. I never thought of that dynamic before. There are people I know who I get feedback from who watch this channel who themselves deal with issues of fallout. Some of them live like places in the South where this is a bit more of an issue. Is there anywhere yes. you would recommend that they go to find support or to possibly maybe even someday end up participating in a study like this if it happens? Well, I think if they wanted to participate, that would be wonderful because the more that we can have people's shared experiences and get the information from the person with the experience, the better. And as far as on the counseling aspect, I myself plan to inform within my information as I, you know, that you're kind of your marketing thing as far as being a counselor that I can counsel both via distance, such as online, like Skype and so forth, or in person. Where now would you suggest people go for support for this kind of thing? I could even put a link in the box if there's some yeah. place you'd, you suggest that people So, go. Um, from religion is the one big website that's out there that has a lot of really valuable, great information. And they do have in their, go through their tabs, they have an area about more information or resources, and they have a secular therapy project. So you can either be a therapist and register as a therapist, or you can be a client and, and register as a client. So you have to go through their you know registration, open account, and then you have access to finding therapists within your area. The problem that I have found myself as looking into that, and like I said earlier, I need to find a counselor. So I'm looking for someone who's an atheist. In Oregon, I found two. One is in Portland and one is in Medford. Neither of them are here in central Oregon where I live. So that shows how much the ball is being dropped here. So I need to see an, a counselor in person. And I think for a lot of people, they would rather see a counselor in person rather than doing it online. Online is you know, something that we do kind of as a secondary. So getting both people who are looking for counseling and getting counselors on board with this and registering to become noticed as a secular therapist. So that's the big one. Yeah, that's a pretty big gap if there's only two in Oregon that you can recognize. I doubt it's better in a lot of other places of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, I think there's actually more who put themselves out there in areas that are more Bible Belt like and so forth. I found one who's really great in Texas. It seems like they're they're really trying to get recognized. We're here in Oregon. It's kind of laid back. It's it's like, oh, there's no need for it. Oh, you, but there is a need for it. So you just bleed in with the secular people, like you were saying before. Nobody sees yeah. the need where. And that's where a lot of the Bible Belt does have some of the stronger atheist communities, just because there's a need for exactly. it. Exactly. So. Yeah. And a more firebrand kind of people in your face who are pushing back just as hard as the evangelicals pushing yeah. them. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. I think we're close to where I'm ready to wrap up as far as my questions go. But is there anything else that you wanted to share that we hadn't really been able to cover yet? I do. Well, currently we're now in school. We're now talking about addictions. And I feel very strongly that addictions and grief are two areas that seem to have a lot of support faith-based, but limited and atheist particularly. So there are a few things out there. There's grief without belief. There's also some programs instead of the typical which AA, which is very faith-based, there's some programs. There's one in particular called SMART, which is self-management and recovering training. You can Google that, S-M-A-R-T, and just put in there for addictions. And that's a really great one that is science-based, very focused on secular. So those are two things, just resources for people, because feeling isolated, being marginalized, being a minority, Sometimes we may have poor coping and that may lead to depression, addictions. So those are some of the things that I want to put out there. 
Cool. Yeah. And if you're willing to send me any links that you have to any kinds of communities or resources that people listening to this might be able to make use of, then I could, I could okay. add them. So. Okay. And the recovery from religion, these are also on there too. So. Okay. Oops. But sure. I can give you those links. Okay. Anything else before we wrap up? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to talk about this. And I'm just going to keep working at, at moving forward with these ideas and hopefully educating people along the way within my profession. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your willingness to do that and also coming here to talk to me about it. And I hope that we hear more about this. And if anything starts to come of this, you want to come back and share it, I would definitely be interested in hearing more. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. And thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you found this enlightening and we'll be back next week with more scripted presentations and cartoon foolishness. Bye.